thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm excited. We've got a great group here. Um, great to have you here to learn the impact on the upcoming elections on our finally final new legislative maps. Woohoo! I'm Susan Blunt, one of the directors, co-directors of Neighbors on Call. Uh, and Becca Serkin is also here, my co-director and the founder of Neighbors on Call. Now, before we turn the program over to our panel, let us tell you just briefly about Neighbors on Call and how we will operate in this election year. Neighbors on Call is an all-volunteer group focused on electing Democrats to the North Carolina State Legislature. Now, you may ask why focus on the North Carolina Legislature, given that there's so many other important races happening as well. Let me note that in the election of 2018, Neighbors on Call helped break the supermajority in the North Carolina State Legislature. The Republicans up to that point had had a stranglehold on it since 2010, rendering the governor's veto useless. Without the governor's veto, just think what women's reproductive rights we might have here now. It might be like Texas or voter suppression laws could be like Georgia or worse. So we cannot lose that ground. We must not let the Republicans regain <clears throat> the supermajority. Plus, we'd like to focus on moving forward towards regaining the majority. So we're not just in this defensive mode, but move to a majority so our legislature can focus on the issues and concerns that we all care about. We'll hear more tonight about what we can realistically hope for and fight for. Now, what is Knox plan for 2022? First, and we're gonna change the slide, there we go. <laughs> uh, we're gonna identify, first thing we need to do is identify our target districts. Uh, tonight, our panelists are gonna tell us about which districts are in play. And NOC, of course, won't be able to support all of those districts because there'd probably be too many. So in consultation with the House and Senate caucus, we will narrow down to a shorter list for us to target. We're already hard at work in three districts uh, and have been for the past year. And over time, we will take on a few more candidates to support. We don't want to spread ourselves out too thin. So one factor in deciding how many we can support will be the number of canvases and phone banks, phone bankers who are participating in our efforts. And that's a little hint, hint, nudge, nudge. We need you guys to make sure you always sign up for things and bring your friends. We'd love to have even more volunteers. Next, we will engage volunteers by talking to voters at their doors. We will be canvassing because this is recognized as the most effective way to reach voters. Now, there are a couple of reasons why this is particularly important. It turns out that contacting voters early, especially people who may not vote in the midterms, is actually more effective than contacting them closer to the election. That means we need to be busy now and get busier. Also, interestingly, focusing on down ballot candidates like Senator Batch can actually help us carry the candidates at the top. But the converse isn't true. It's an interesting thing that people, if they go in to vote for a lower, candidate on the ballot, they will vote up. But people who get focused on the top few races will go in and vote for those and often just leave the rest of the ballot blank, which is of course heartbreaking. So we can actually leverage the top of the ticket by encouraging people to go in to vote for these legislative races. We also recruit volunteers to phone bank and that method of outreach is really good because we can involve people all over the state and in fact, out of the state. You know, the earlier conversation, quite a few people are talking about being from uh, the Northeast or other parts of the country who care about North Carolina and we are so grateful for their interest in volunteering with us. So we'll keep doing those things. This is not rocket science, it's just elbow grease. So now I will pass the mic over to Dina Papazoglu, who is our statewide liaison. Dina? Thanks, Susan, and hi, everybody. I just wanted to touch on a few other, a, a few things that, um, that Susan mentioned, but I'm just emphasizing because, as you know, there's so much going on, and it can feel very stressful to decide where to focus your efforts and where you can make a difference. The good news is you don't have to do everything, and you actually can't. And some of us have learned that the hard way. <laughs> that is a recipe for burnout, and um, it's not good for you. Um, so the best thing to do, really, is for you and for the movement is to pick one lane and work in it effectively 
and trust that others will fill other lanes. Our Lane at Knock is about electing Democrats to the State House and the State Senate in targeted purple districts. We know, of course, that you might be equally concerned about the judicial races and the U.S. Senate race. Even though that's not our primary focus, our volunteers can still make a difference in statewide races, like Susan was saying. Remember, Sherry Beasley lost her race to, um, in the Chief Justice uh, in 2020 by just 401 votes statewide. This year, we need to help Judge Lucy Inman and Justice Sam Irvin win their races for state Supreme Court by making sure we get the most out of every door knock and phone conversation we have. Uh, you also might be concerned about registering new voters. That is very important, of course, but it's not Knox focus. Our focus is generally on left-leaning voters who are already registered but might not vote. This is a tremendously important group to reach, and frankly, it's an easier group to turn out in the short term. And I want you to know that you can truly make a difference. As one person, it can be hard to know if you're moving the needle, but in 2020, hundreds of us canvassed and phone banked. It's our collective work that makes a difference. And keep in mind that State Representative Ricky Hurtado won by only 477 votes in 2020. Just a few volunteers can make or break a win that close. And we realize that your time is valuable. If you can only do one thing, choose talking directly to voters. Like Susan said, that is absolutely the most effective thing you can do. And last but not least, it is okay to be nervous about talking to voters. We get it, a lot of us found it hard at first. Um, we have been there and Knock offers a lot of support. You'll always have a script, training, and a targeted voter contact list provided by the campaign. It's all about increasing name recognition with a smile. You get to meet the candidates at the canvases and phone banks, a knock point person will be at every event to support you. For canvases, you'll always canvas with a partner. And if you want to, you can sign up as a silent canvasser where you'll canvas with a mentor who does all the talking at the door while you record the data. For phone banks, you usually get the script in advance and you can request a buddy to help you get the hang of things. So you have got this. We invite you to join us in our lane and sign up for a bunch of events and canvases and phone banks. And we are behind you every step of the way. And now let's welcome our guests. I am passing the mic back over to Becca Zorkin, our other not co-director to introduce everyone. Thank you so much, Gina. Hi, everybody. Um, I am honored to introduce our panelists. Representative Greg Meyer will be, rep will be moderating the discussion tonight. He has served in the North Carolina State House since 2013, representing House District 50 in Orange and Caswell counties, and he is now running for State Senate District 23. He's a trained social worker. He worked in North Carolina public schools for 16 years, and he was the coordinator of the Blue Ribbon Mentor Advocate Program. Representative Meyer still works with schools and nonprofits as a partner and COO of the Equity Collaborative. Senator Jay Chowdhury represents State Senate District 15 in Wake County. He grew up in Fayetteville and graduated from Davidson College, Columbia University Law School of International and Public Affairs, and NC Central University School of Law. He served as a special counsel to then Attorney General Roy Cooper, and as general counsel and senior policy advisor to then state treasurer, Janet Cowell. Senator Chowdhury is now in his third term in the state Senate and he serves as the minority whip. Representative Vernetta Alston serves district 29 in Durham. She received a BA from NC State and a law degree from UNC Chapel Hill. Representative Alston worked at the Center for Death Penalty Litigation, representing death row inmates. She served on the Durham City Council for two years. And in 2020, Governor Cooper appointed her to the State House. She was elected to her first full term in that same year. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you here. 
Representative Meyer, I'm going to hand it off to you. And before you get into the discussion, uh, I'd just like to ask if you could please start us off with a summary of the redistricting saga and how you feel about where we are now. And the mic is yours. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Dina and Susan. Thank you for a great introduction. Thank you to everyone in Neighbors on Call for everything that you're doing. You need to leave this meeting feeling so empowered that what you're going to do this year is so incredibly important. And it really is because we're at this really important pivot point because of the way that redistricting has played out. You're gonna hear so much about it from Vernetta and Jay, but the saga, like the saga is like a multi-part series in the movies, right? That we could go all the way back for decades in North Carolina. But if you just start with, if you remember that when the last decades redistricting uh, legal arguments went all the way up to the US Supreme Court and in that case, the US Supreme Court decided that they couldn't rule on partisan gerrymandering because it was a political question, but that state courts could, depending on their constitution, which set up why this year's redistricting ruling was such a monumental ruling for North Carolina, because for the first time in history, we have a ruling from a jurisdictional court that partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. And unless the courts would overturn that in the future, which is why it's important to make sure that we get good statewide turnout for democratic justices who are more likely to uphold this precedent, uh, we are in a place where we have a very different playing ground for redistricting battles from here on out. And so after the court said partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional, then they sent it back to the legislature. The legislature passed new maps for the North Carolina House, the North Carolina Senate, and the North Carolina congressional districts. Those went back to the court and the court did approve those new maps. Now we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what those maps look like, but the underlying fundamental importance of this year's election is based on the fact that these new maps are really the most fair maps that we've seen for North Carolinians in the last decade. And so we have the most balanced maps at the congressional level, we have the most balanced map at the House level, the North Carolina House level, certainly the best and most fair map that I've seen in my eight years in the State House. And we have a slightly less balanced map in the Senate, but still has some improvements over the past. And we'll dive into those. With a more balanced set of maps, we can expect better policy outcomes. Sometimes those of us that are up to our eyeballs in the politics are just focused on what do the maps mean, who are the voters, and what does it predict for the elections? But what we have to remember is this is really about what's the impact on the voters. And we've already seen that the demographic changes and the map changes in North Carolina and the pressure from grassroots activists like everybody who's on the Zoom have shifted the political dynamics in North Carolina even over the last decade. Phil Berger is probably the most disliked member of the Republican Party by most Democrats, maybe with a couple other uh, Republicans who have gotten close to him in the last couple of years. But he's so disliked in part because of how powerful he is. And over the last 10 years, no one has been more responsible for stopping one of our top priorities, which is the expansion of Medicaid something that would give 600,000 North Carolinians health insurance, provide 43,000 jobs, billions of dollars of economic development for North Carolina. And Phil Berger has stood in the way of all of that until this year when he said out loud that he is in support of Medicaid expansion. That's a sign that the demographics have led to political shifts and that the maps have a different reality and that things are shifting. So what does that mean for other policy priorities, for education, for climate change? Climate change, another area where this year we passed the most monumental climate change bill that North Carolina has ever had, committing to reducing carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. So we're seeing these big shifts in policy. What can we do on marijuana? What can we do on transportation? What can we do on any number of issues, early childhood education, mental health, et cetera? All the sands are shifting on all these issues in part because the maps are shifting and the political reality is shifting. 2022 is going to be an incredibly challenging election for Democrats 
It is the first off-year election with a Democratic president in office in DC, traditionally a very difficult time. But we have to get out there and we have to defend North Carolina because we have to win those statewide judicial races. We have to do the best we can under these legislative maps and we have to win competitive congressional seats that we haven't had recently where we've had competitive congressional races. So we have so much work to do. And that's why it's so important that you're putting your time and energy into it. You're gonna hear more about it from my colleagues tonight. I am proud to represent Orange County where most of the NOC members are, but I know there are others of you out there who are represented by my colleague in the North Carolina House, Vernetta Alston, or even some of you who are in Wake County with Senator Jay Chaudhary. And we're gonna hear from both of them I'm gonna start with Representative Austin, and I'm gonna ask you, Representative Austin, to wear us up just a little, to, to, to get us ready just a little bit. I wanna ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. And I wanna know, out of all those books in the background of your Zoom, how many of those have you actually read and which one is your favorite? And then if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your books, can you also also tell us you're an attorney, Senator Chaudhary's attorney, I'm not an attorney. Are we done with the legal battle over maps or are we not done? Tell us that and then I'll come, Jay, I'll come to you with another question next. But I'm gonna turn it over to my house colleague, Vernetta Alston. Sure, uh, thank you, Representative Meyer. Uh, and thank you everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, honored to, to join this wonderful organization and to join my colleagues, uh, Senator Chaudhary and Representative Myers. So um, just thank you for all you do. Um, so I'm Brennan Alston. Uh, I represent House District 29, running for re-election this year. It's kind of southwestern Durham County, parts of, parts of downtown until, until 2023 when I'll have kind of the, the, the most southern bits of, of the county, uh, which I'll be very excited to pick up. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. I am, I'm a retired attorney, I tell people. Um, uh, I served on the Durham City Council for a couple of years, really loved and appreciated uh, serving locally, but I'm really thrilled at the opportunities that serving in the House has already presented itself. And I think the things that I see in the future, uh, in part because of the, the, the maps that Representative Myers just outlined and, and the opportunities that I think will be forthcoming if we do the things we need to do in this election cycle, especially uh, to put us in a good position to, to really get some great things done policy-wise. So I'm excited about the future and excited about working with you all. In terms of the books, I'll plead the fifth on how many I've read, um, but I'll say, and it's impossible to pick a favorite. I'll just, I'll note, I have a book that I got many years ago from a friend who's a professional photographer called The Innocence. I don't know if, if anyone else has seen it. It's kind of like a coffee table book, but it's, a, it's profiles uh, from many years ago when the wrongful conviction movement really started to pick up in the United States in terms of kind of popular understanding of, of wrongful convictions. Um, and so it's a lot of profiles of folks who were wrongfully convicted and exonerated and told their story with these beautiful pictures. And I came upon it shortly after I started practicing and it was, it was a really meaningful kind of gift. Um, so it's something that I appreciate back here. Um, so to your question of, are we, are we done? Um, and I'd appreciate Senator Chaudhry's uh, chiming in on this potentially too. I think, you know, we could be, you know, I think there's still some appeals outstanding both on uh, there's an appeal of the Voting Rights Act uh, claim from the plaintiffs um, in the litigation that's still out there to be decided. Um, there's also still an appeal related to the Senate maps. You know, my understanding is the, the decisions from the North Carolina Supreme Court didn't tackle or, or speak to the substantive issues around the Senate maps, which to your point, Representative Meyer, you know, are probably the least fair um, of the ones that you know, were passed Mm -hmm. um, and accepted by the courts. So um, those appeals are, appeals are still are still ongoing, still pending. Um, you know, we it's very likely given the the, the uh, congressional map was you know drawn by the special master that we're going to have to revisit that in 2024. Um, and so you know we'll kind of see what comes to pass. But it's also possible that these map the legislative maps kind of stay in place. I think. One thing that I do want to note is, again, kind of this motivation for folks on the call is if we kind of do what the work that we need to do um, to turn out the Democratic vote. Uh, and I know I'm interested in winning a majority in the North Carolina House, you know, we could be in a position in the future to, you know, push for a fair process, uh, you know, you know, redraw maps that are even fairer than the ones that we have. So those opportunities are out there in addition to the other policy ones we have on the table. And so, you know, 
we're, we're probably not done, at least on the congressional side with these appeals, but I think there's some opportunity in the future. I'll stop and, and let my colleagues chime in. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Representative Austin. Senator Chaudhary, my personal question for you, you can introduce yourself however you want, but because you're in your legislative office with those fine decorative walls behind you, I want to know, do you think that the legislative building is an architectural feat and something we should be celebrating in North Carolina, or do you think it is an architectural atrocity? And then can you pick up on what Vernetta was saying about what's going on with the congressional maps and whether they're gonna come back to us before 2024 and like, what's the legal situation with those maps? Turning it over to you, Jay. Yeah, um, Representative Meyer, always great to be with you as well as Representative Alston, um, I, I will say for those who are from Durham and Orange County, you have incredible representation. Um, I, I will also say just a big quick plug for Representative Meyer and his work. Um, really, his work he did in, in 2018 was absolutely instrumental in breaking the supermajority. I think I think most of you all know that, but um, we, we partnered in many instances together. It was a lot of fun. I think we had a lot of fun doing it together. And I think to underscore Representative Meyer's point, uh, when you change the makeup of the General Assembly, you can also see some policy results. And you know, we've, we've seen some of that in 2020. So um, great question. I love the question about uh, the, the General Assembly building that uh, some of y'all may know was designed by, uh, by Edward Stone that was an architect out of Arkansas, but joined a, a New York City law firm. So I will tell you as a, as someone who has worked in the highest levels of all three branches of gov three branches of government in North Carolina, I was not a big fan of the General Assembly. Um, what is behind me, I, I think uh, Representative Alston and Meyer have been told this is that it is not a uh, cinder block, but it is crushed marble is what they tell us. Um, I, I did do a Zoom call recently with some constituents who said that it looked like I was in prison. Um, but, uh, but, but I will tell you, uh, I think that the building has grown on me because I, I, I think there are moments when you are in the chamber and you can kind of see the sunlight come through that you, I, I think it's actually qu quite a feat. And for those who may or may not know, the same architect that designed uh, the General Assembly building is the same architect that designed the, the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and you can see some of the remarkable um, similarities between, uh, between the two um between the two buildings so I, I probably fall in the camp of uh it being a, a feat um although i i was never designated or designated into the depths of uh, a windowless chamber well i am in a windowless chamber now but uh representative meyer experienced that at one point um uh to answer your second question i think the maps are set until um at least for this for this coming election cycle uh i am I'm, I'm not hopeful about what's going to happen with the congressional uh, maps, given the, the uh, I guess, the opinion, which I will say I've not read. I've been talking to some of the attorneys and our staff about it. But uh, my, my sense is that the congressional maps that the U.S. Supreme Court will take those up on, on the merits. And there is, um, I mean, there is, there is real concern about the United States Supreme Court taking these maps up and talking to one of the plaintiff's lawyers that helped litigate the maps. I think the court has become so conservative that something that we did not think was possible only a few years ago now could be possible for them to, I think, look at the congressional maps on the merit. So I'm not uh, terribly optimistic. I hope I'm more optimistic, Representative Meyer, about what the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court does on the merits with our um, state legislative maps, but you know, for right now and for purposes of our call, uh, as you've said, I mean, I think the playing field is set for our legislative races coming up in November 2022. <clears throat> We've learned in North Carolina over the last couple of decades that like the redistricting battle is never done. So maybe uh, we do. Our elections are most likely set for 2022. They are not most likely done for the rest of the decade. So we'll see what happens. Jay, we're going to stick with you. The North Carolina Senate maps, what do they mean for us in terms of the ability to prevent Republicans from regaining a supermajority, which is something that Senator Berger has said openly that he wants to achieve under these maps versus Democrats' ability to gain a majority, whether it be in this election or in the future? What can you tell us about the downside and upside of the Senate maps? 
Yeah. So um, I I appreciate you highlighting the uh, Senate Republican leader, given the fact that you are running for the Senate now. Um, I am I am in agreement. I mean, I think that I think that probably one of the most significant development in our state's political history has been in the last decade that Senator Berger, who is the leader of the Republican Senate, has really been the architect of the fastest, quickest turnaround of a progressive to conservative state. I think that if you talk to political observers, they would tell you that Phil Berger is the most powerful elected official uh, in this state. And we see, to represent Myers' points, when you see the policies that have come out of the General Assembly into this chamber, um, they all, you know, tax cuts, underfunding public education, failure to expand Medicaid, uh, voter ID laws, anti-LGBTQ laws, um, many of those can be attributed to what's happening in the Senate. Uh, that, that's point number one for why the Senate um, is critically important in our effort to, uh, I think, what I, I would say, shield and protect our Senate Democrats going into 2022, but then also building the pipeline to take back the majority um, in the years that are ahead of us. So what does that, so what does that map look like for us? So I, I think that if you look at the Senate maps, there tends to be a general agreement that Democrats will probably start with a base of 18 Senate Democrats. And those are, you know, predictably in the, the blue counties that you see here on the map. But then let's talk about why it's important to get to 21. 21 is a magic number that allows us to uphold Governor Cooper's veto, um, provided that we can all hang together. And the Senate has been able to demonstrate that as we talked about at the beginning of this call. We just had 22 Senate Democrats um, a little over two hours ago uphold Governor Cooper's veto of the Free Smiles Act, which was an you know Republican effort to try to uh, politicize mass um, with our kids. Uh, as many of you all know, we don't have a statewide mass mandate. 110 school boards now have made mass optional for our kids. Um, but I, it, but I think it was yet another example of where the Senate was holding tight um, in stopping a number of bad bills. We've been able to stop bad reproductive rights bills, bad gun bills, and bad voting rights bills too. So how do we? So how do we get to 21? So. Uh, you know, the good news, I would say for folks, you know, neighbors on call, if you're from Wake County, Orange or Durham County, it really starts with Senate District 17. As it says, it's holding Senator Sidney Batch. Uh, many of you all know Senator Batch because you all have helped her when she ran as representative. I mean, this is a this is a clear toss up district. It is a 50 50 um, Democratic Republican district. So this is a great example of where it's going to be important to turn out our voters and make sure we get them to the polls. Um, this is also a district, light Senate District 18, both of these districts, not surprisingly, because they are in Wake County, are trending Democratic. And so we know the trend of these counties trending Democratic is an added factor for us, but we can't take that for granted. Then we move to the northern part of Wake County, which also includes Granville County. We have a, a great young lawyer named Mary Wills Bodie, whose family has a, had a long service and has a, has a long history of public service. Her mother actually served as the Department of Health and Human Services a secretary for our state. Um, her father does government relations here at the General Assembly, um, but and, and she's actually done a lot around redistricting herself. She is from Granville County. Family is from Granville County, though they live now in Wake County, so we think that some of the, the, the family ties that she has in Granville, make, in Wake County, make her a particularly strong candidate. The Republican nominee has not been determined yet, but E.C. Sykes, who self-funded the race against uh, Secretary of State Elaine Marshall, uh, could possibly be uh, the, the nominee and could potentially self-fund. But again, we think we have a great candidate in holding Mary Wills Bodie. And then is it then if whoever's doing the uh, the slideshow here, if we move to the right, we you see the hold on um, Senate District Three. Um, we are taking a wait and see approach for this Senate district until the primary concludes. But um, this again is a Senate Democratic district. It's probably a Democratic plus three district for us. But as many of y'all who know political geography in North Carolina, looking at these um, 
looking at these counties, this is an area that has actually been trending away from Democrats. And I think that uh, Donald Trump has probably accelerated that. That being said, it still is a Democratic uh, district, and we believe that we can hold on to that district. So that's how we get. So that's how we get to 21. And then the question is, where else can we look um, to potentially pick up seats? And we start again with Vance Franklin, Nash County. Uh, Mark Speed, who is a county commissioner uh, from Franklin County, uh, whose father served in the General Assembly. Um, that that is also this is also a, de a slightly Democratic district, although um, Senator Lisa Barnes is an incumbent there. Um, we feel really good about having recruited Commissioner Speed as a candidate for us. And then I would move down to Senate District 21, which is labeled a flip. Uh, this is Frank McNeil, who actually ran for Congress, I believe, in 2020. Uh, this is actually one of the promising seats that came out of redistricting um, the redistricting process for us because both sides essentially created this map that has now become political. As you'll see, uh, 21 actually extends into part of Cumberland County as well. So uh, the combination of it being in Cumberland along with Moore County uh, makes this a, a good district, although Senator Tom McGinnis, who has represented different parts of, of this region, has now made Moore County his home. Um, we've, is, if many of you followed the Helen Probst Mills state Senate campaign when she ran as uh, ran from Moore County, I think that district included Richmond and Anson. Uh, Senator McGinnis was the opponent there. He, um, he, he, he can be a tough opponent, but again, we think the numbers are, uh, are, are good for us there. And then lastly, if we look at the flip here, um, we've got Jason Minicosi, um, that's in New Hanover County, there is seven. Um, again, the, again, New Hanover County is really a purple county now. I mean, they did, as you, as, if you can see, there's a little bit of a notch right there from Brunswick that goes into the Brunswick County District. Uh, that, that part was frankly gerrymandered uh, in order to take a lot of um, Democrats out of that seat, but we still think that they're, uh, that we still think this is a flippable seat. And, and the last one I'll mention since we've got this on here, um, who I think is a really uh, interesting candidate is in candidate is Senate District 24, Daryl Gibson, uh, running in Hoke, uh, Sanford, and Robeson County. Uh, Senator Danny Britt uh, used to represent Robeson, uh, Bladen, and Columbus County, but now has been redistricted here. But uh, Daryl actually has good roots in this district too, and we view him as a strong contender as well. It's a great rundown, Jay. Thanks for all the details. Um, I can't wait for everybody here to get to know all these candidates. I can't wait to get to know some of these candidates. I look forward to serving with them in the North Carolina Senate. Let's shift over to the House maps and to Representative Alston. Uh, Vernetta, same questions for you. What's the upside on the House maps? What's the downside on the House maps? And what districts are we going to be chasing? Sure, I appreciate that uh, question. So, you know, I think obviously goal number one is to hold the seats that we have and do everything we can to stay out of the super minority. And I do think this year, uh, particularly with these maps, that there's a, there's a path towards us um, getting the majority in, in 2022. You know, I think if you look at, you know, um, you know, Josh Stein's numbers in, in the last cycle and you know, taking into consideration that we've got Sherry Beasley at the top of the ticket. Um, you know, logic dictates that if, you know, with Stein's just, just over 50% of the vote, uh, and he carried, I think, 59 districts in the last cycle, you know, by the numbers that, you know, Beasley can, can with our help, do at least that, that we should be able to win 59 districts um, and get the majority. So um, that's certainly the hope. Um, and if we don't do it in 22 with the, the, the way that population growth is, is going up in, in Durham, Guilford, and Forsyth, and uh, obviously Mecklenburg and Wake, um, you know, will be, you know, preparing obviously for 2024. Um, and I'll turn to the map. And in terms of seats to start with, again, obviously we want to hold all of our current seats. Um, you know, we, we had a double bunk with um, in District 10 with, uh, Majority Leader Bell and Raymond Smith. So I'm going to leave that aside. But of, of the other seats that we want to hold, District 47, so we'll start down in Robinson County. Um, 
which is uh, an open seat this year. Um, it was held by Representative Charles Graham. Um, it's a, such an important district for so many reasons, uh, not the least of which it's, it's our only, Robinson County is our only tri-racial county. Uh, you know, the political dynamics amongst, you know, uh, white residents, black residents, and Lumbee residents is, is complex and politically is, is proven to be uh, really, really important. And so, you know, we're hopeful that we can, um, uh, you know, kind of support the needs of the Lumbee population and, 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 and have a good democratic turnout um, in that district. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, we need to hold uh, District 25, which is a, another open seat uh, in Nash, where um, Representative Galliard is, is vacating that. Oh, no, sorry, he's coming back. My apologies. We need to hold that seat. We also need to hold District 42, which shouldn't be too difficult. That's um, Marvin Lucas, uh, who's, who's an incumbent, uh, but his seat got a little bit more difficult. So, um, you know, we just want to make sure that he wins that seat. And then the neighboring district in 43 in Cumberland is Diane Wheatley, who's a Republican. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers got a little bit better for her um, in that district, but we still think that, yeah, okay, sorry, I was reading your chat there, Mr. Um, the, the numbers for Diane Wheatley got a little bit better, um, but we still think that we can compete in that district and hopefully flip it. Um, and honestly, uh, maybe you get all four seats in Cumberland County, which I'll get to in a second. I know you all canvassed recently up in Northern Wake uh, for Representative Everett, Everett. So obviously that's going to be a really important seat to hold. Um, and so those are, you know, those are seats that, you know, have been held by Democrats or in the case of Diane Wheatley that we feel very strongly that we can win. In addition to hers in Cumberland across the way in 45, that's an open seat that was, um, that's currently held by John Zoka, who's vacating that seat. Uh, the numbers have gotten significantly better for Democrats. So, um, you know, we expect to win that seat. Um, if you Representative go, Alston, I think I missed 42. Can you just tell me again which county that was? Yeah, it's kind of in the, in Cumberland, if you it should be say 43. I can't see the numbers very well. Yeah. There Becca, there's four districts in Cumberland. So oh, your map okay. might have to zoom in a little bit more to left. see them, but yeah. Yeah, over that. Sorry. But, um, I see. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so if you want to go up next to Northern Durham in person, there's going to be a new district um, here, kind of north of I 85 in Durham, and for all of Person County. Um, you know, we're very, very hopeful that, and, and feel very strongly that we can win that seat, you know, uh, not Caswell, just person in, in Northern Durham. Um, you know, I think the, the turnout and the democratic kind of mobilization in Person County has been really strong of late. And we think with, you know, the, the registered Democrats that we have in Durham, and I think the, the force, as we see on this call, that we can bring in terms of volunteer support from Durham, that we can, we can win that seat. Um, if you, uh, let's see, we've got, if we go down to Mecklenburg, down towards Mecklenburg, there's going to be an open seat in 112. Yeah. Um, so that should be an easy get for us. Yeah, it's not on here. It's, it should be an easy get. It's, it's probably not noted on your map, but I just wanted to note it as a new one um, that we should pick up very easily. Um, you've got 98, which you know, is currently John Bradford that we certainly hope to flip. Christy Clark had been in that seat. She flipped it before. Uh, and we, you know, are very hopeful that we can flip that seat again. Um, and I see you've got 82, uh, which is Cabarrus and currently held by Kristen Baker. And yeah, we think that the numbers are really starting to move our direction. And, you know, we want to try to win that seat this year. And if we, if we don't do it this year, we should certainly, with the growth in that north of Mecklenburg County, um, be able to win that seat in 24. Um, and I see also the new seat in Cabarrus in 73 um, should, be a, should be a straightforward get for us. So we're excited about that opportunity. Uh, 103, that is the seat that was vacated, that will be vacated by Rachel Hunt. So that should be pretty straightforward. And obviously we do wanna hold Brandon Lofton's seat. So uh, locking Mecklenburg up um, as always is gonna be incredibly important. Um, and if you wanna go back, I guess, towards the triad, I just wanted to note a couple more in Forsyth and Guilford. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, 74, um, 
which is uh, currently held by um, Jeff Zanger, um, we think that we can we think that we can win that seat. Um, similarly, with uh, John Fairclaw, in uh, fifty two. Sorry, that's Guilford. But just wanted to note that uh, in fifty two, we're also hopeful that if 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 we compete this year and win it, fantastic. If we don't win this year, we think that we can get it in uh, twenty twenty four. Um, and so you just circled 62 in Guilford. So I'll move over there. Um, so that, I think that's, am I? Maybe I'm I don't think I marked 52. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, 60, okay, 62. That's Fairclough. If I, if now I'm getting mine. Try again. Yeah, that was Fairclough. Okay, then yeah. So that's Fairclough. Like I said, we hope to, we hope to beat him this year. If not, just again, with the growth in this part of this, in the state, um, we should certainly be in great position for 2024, but we obviously want to do everything we can to flip that this year. Um, and 59 is John Hardister, kind of similar scenario. Um, the growth that district just continues to, to lean Democratic. And so, you know, we want to do everything we can to, to pull that one. And um, if not in 2022 and 2024, I think also just to know if you want to just run back over to um, District 12 and 10, really kind of back east a little bit, just to note, you know, I wouldn't say that these are, you know, top priority, but um, in 12 where Chris Humphrey sits um, and in House District 10, um, you know, I think in the future, those are, are gonna be great opportunities for us to um, pursue as targets. You know, if, if, if the growth kind of east of Wake County and the growth in Johnson County that we know, that we know is coming over the next few years continues to materialize. I think there'll be some great opportunities in that area as well. Um, so I think I got, I think I covered the ones that I wanted to cover in terms of targets, but if you have any questions, um, please, I'm, I'm all ears. A lot of details. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Becca, go ahead. I just wanted to highlight Rick Yurtado because Oh, sure. That's where neighbors on calls. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about that one. And oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we absolutely want to hold Ricky seat up in Alamance County. We definitely want to hold uh, Robert Reeves in 54, uh, you know, his district got a, a little bit harder. Um, so we definitely want your support down there. You, you know, to the Southern Wake District down in 37, um, you know, also, I think one that, you know, I think we can, I think we could go get, you know, that's, that's currently Aaron Perret and, um, you know, the numbers continue to lean Democratic and, you know, I think we can be competitive and win that seat as well. So I apologize, I missed that little, that little pocket there. It's a lot of districts. I think that one um, thing that we have to think about is beyond 2022 and where mm -hmm. demographic changes happen. So like Representative Alston just talking about 37 and South Wake, that district is going to continue to have more housing built. It's going to continue to have more people move in. It's like the rest of Wake County, it's going to continue to turn blue. On the Senate map, Senator Choudhury and I were just having a little private chat in the, in the chat messages about Senator Berger's district, which is Northern Guilford County and Rockingham County. Um, and on that Senate map, it, it's actually possible that you pick up Senator Berger's seat sometime later this district because there's so much housing and new people moving into those portions of Guilford County. Mm -hmm. So the, these maps may not give us the most amazing chance in 2022. We're going to fight as hard as we can. But if you think about what's possible over the rest of the decade, we know what Democrats have to do to win. And we need your help, which is why we're going to turn it back to the good folks at Neighbors on Call for a minute to talk to us about canvassing, phone banking, and everything else you can do to help Democrats win elections in 2022 and beyond. Thank you so much for all of that. And we will pass it back to you shortly for some Q&A from the audience. Um, but before we do that, like you said, we need to have a quick pause because we want to ask you to sign up to talk to voters in key districts. For now, Neighbors on Call is focusing on protecting three incumbents, two in Wake and one in Alamance. And I know Representative Meyer said we're mostly in Orange, but actually at this point, Durham, I think, has surpassed us and a lot of folks from Chatham and Wake and Cumberland County and picking up from many counties across the state. So. 
I actually would love in the chat if folks could do just a little, just to give us a little informal survey. If you live near other areas besides the Wake and Alamance districts that I'm talking about, where there's there are tight races, if you're interested in canvassing in those areas, or if you already are canvassing in those areas, would you just let us know in the chat? We would love to know about that. So in the southern part of Wake County, we are supporting Senator Sidney Batch, that was Senate District 17. In the northern part of Wake, we're supporting Representative Terrence Everett, that was House District 35, and Representative Rick Hurtado is in Alamance County in 63. Those were all mentioned just now. So all those folks are looking at very tough races. Those are seats that we do need to hold to fend off supermajority for sure. And so, and all three are really wonderful people that we're just really proud to work for and we do need to keep them in office. So if you're new to this, we encourage you to commit to one thing, either phone banking or canvassing. If you've done this before, we encourage you to pick two and we've got two months up there. So if you can do more than one thing in a month, that would be really great. Um, because this early voter contact is critical. So please go to Neighbors on Call right now. Someone is gonna be putting that, I think Julie's gonna put that in the chat for us, that link. Um, it'll take you to our website where you can sign up for all of these. And it's this is awkward, but we can handle it. We're giving a three minute countdown for you to actually go and do this right now. And I am gonna pass the mic to Fran. Grigsby, who is our out of state chapter leader, because we do have a lot of out of state volunteers who are part of Neighbors on Call and have their own chapter. Fran, passing it to you to get us through the next three awkward minutes. Thank you, Becca. Becca asked me to talk because I can talk for three minutes on any topic, but my favorite topic is getting people to sign up for the phone banks. If you're local, of course, they're canvases. Um, I want to speak particularly to the out of state people who are here and or who represent groups that might have people that can do phone banks with us. I'd like to invite everybody to put where you're from in the chat because it's a great way to recognize the in and out of state people that are here. And um, if there's anyone that you think should know about these, uh, these chats and phone, I mean, canvases and phone banks, please let us know because uh, we would be glad to connect with them. We'd be glad to have them sign up. I know that we've got people here from Massachusetts. We've got people here from California. We've got people here from all over uh, North Carolina. And we just like to know who you are. Um, as uh, as the, the various people who have spoken have said, we've got a, we've got a hard road to hoe here because it's better than it's ever been. Thank you, Greg. I love the way you put it. It's better than it's ever been. And we have a shot, a shot, a, bleh, a shot at figuring out how to get it, how can turn the state blue again. And so I really appreciate you folks uh, who have given us that that roadmap to get there. Um, I wonder, Greg, if you'd like to say anything further about the roadmaps or summary while we're filling up these three minutes? Sure, I mean, look, I think Sean asked an important question, which is geographical, which is just the way these maps are drawn. The path does not go through the West. It goes through the urban corridor on Long 85 from the Triangle, the Triad in Charlotte, and it goes through the East. And there's all those districts in Eastern North Carolina where the key in those districts is to register all of the unregistered voters who are likely to vote Democrat. And that's why folks like the New North Carolina Project and the Rural Project, so many organizations are focusing on those areas. And the Democrats have to run on messages and themes that really are are directly applicable to rural voters, to black voters, to working class voters. And we can win those areas if we just use the right strategy. We cannot depend on just flipping the shifting suburban areas. We have to do those, but we also can win if we go out and flip those rural areas that have voters who would vote for us if we talk to them. And I know it's really amazing that everybody drives from Durham County to Alamance County or from Orange County to Wake County, we're gonna need you to get in your cars and drive to places that are a little bit farther away. There's great barbecue in Wayne County, 
Wow. There's amazing natural environments out in some of those eastern counties where you could get a good hike in if you didn't get enough walking when you were knocking doors. We're going to need you to go a little bit further than off the 85 corridor if we're really going to flip these chambers. Thank you, Greg. And um, it's back to Becca, I believe you now, for picking up on the sign up. Thank you to everybody for having signed up. Thank you so much, everyone. And you can keep doing that. And we will be sharing out the link tomorrow too, of course. And um, I'm gonna actually pass it back to Greg to handle the Q&A. So we're gonna take question and answer from the audience. And so if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in and uh, patients and myself will be monitoring those trying to make sure that uh, Jay and Bernetta can answer them. Um, thanks for rallying the troops, everyone. It's great to make sure that you focus not just on the intellectual part of this, but on the work part of this. This isn't just about political hobbyism, y'all. And this is about getting work done. It's part of why I love Knock. Neighbors on Call actually does the work. There are some other organizations out there that gather people, but they don't turn into actual boots on the ground. Y'all do that. I love seeing the photos when you're canvassing. It's really amazing. Okay, I'm gonna start with Patience's question. If you, other people have questions, put them in the chat. They don't have to be about the maps. You could ask about policy, you could ask about whatever you want. Uh, Patience asks, out of the total 120 House seats and 50 Senate seats, how many have a Democratic candidate? Uh, Vernetta, how many have a Democratic candidate in the House? I think we're at 92 is yeah, what I have here, which is, which is great. And I, I just wanna to note too, if I could, Greg, if you don't mind, um, you know, of those 92, you know, we have two, the first two Democratic AAPI women running, uh, the first Democratic 1B woman, first Democratic Latino woman, uh, six veterans, you know, farmers, faith leaders, we've got just, a, just an incredibly diverse um, slate. Yeah, amazing, really diverse slate, really fantastic people running. Jay, how about in the Senate? So we have 37 out of 50 members that are running. We've been able to field candidates really in our most competitive um, races with a, with really an impressive number of, of women, I would say, that, that, that are running. I mean, last, last election cycle, um, I believe four out of our six Senate caucus members that came in were women of color. So we, we've seen kind of the same diverse trends um, that, that Renetta has been talking about. We've seen that in the Senate uh, immediately. Uh, Greg, if I can, if I can just say one thing, I think I've said this on the call before to just illustrate the importance of door knocking because uh, you're absolutely right. A lot of groups talk about it, but uh, I've you know the reason I love neighbors on call and I've talked to Becca and Susan about this um, is because it's so incredibly important to door knock. Um, we did a post election analysis in 2020 of our state senate races, and it turned out that if we had turned out 13,500 more voters. These are not voters that are registered. I mean, these are voters that are already have a partisan score of 70 or higher, which is a fairly high partisan score. It goes to exactly the mission of neighbors on call. If we had turned out 13,500 more voters in five state Senate seats, we would have been in the majority today. I mean, that's, that's how close the margin was for us to take back the majority. I mean, North Carolina is just the closest state. Like, it doesn't matter who the pundits pay attention to. No one is closer than us on every metric. And I mean, it's part of the reason why in Wake, Durham, and Orange, we need to focus on turnout even at home. And this is not to my benefit because the general election is what I'm talking about. Like, we have to we have to hold those court seats. And that comes through winning these blue counties like the ones that we live in. Um, all right, we've got a question from Francis. Do we know who the candidates will be in every district? Are some of the House and Senate races competitive in the primaries? Jay, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, so um, very timely question since today in our Senate caucus meeting, we actually have four incumbent Senate members that actually have primary challengers. And we talked a little bit about that in the presentation. So in Senate District 3, which is the Northeastern set of counties, uh, Senator Ernestine Baysmore is being challenged by Valerie Jordan, who is a sitting member of the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, many of you all may have seen uh, the news this week of uh, Senator Kurt Devier, uh, who is an incumbent senator from Cumberland County, has a primary challenger from uh, Val Applewhite, who I believe is a former city council member in Fayetteville. 
uh, Senator Toby Fitch, which is highlighted here in Senate District 4, which is Wayne Green and Wilson as a challenger I, uh, from Raymond Smith, right, who is a House colleague. Um, of, uh, of Representative Meyer and Representative Alston. And then lastly, uh, Representative Julie Mayfield, who is our incumbent senator in Buncombe County, has, I believe, two challengers, including a current city council member that's challenging her as well. Um, so I can't really speak to which of these races are going to be competitive, but they, uh, but they have, but they have challengers. And Vernetta, what about on the House side? So, so yes, we certainly have a number of districts where we're going to have uh, primaries. You know, some of which in uh, some of the you know kind of districts that we've talked about uh, in the rundown on the House map. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how these primaries play out. You know, I think obviously the the goal and you know what my hope is from this group is that you know we will. Help all these Democrats turn out and fundraise, um, and then turn our you know turn all of our attention obviously to who our nominees are, kind of headed into the general election, uh, specifically in these these kind of target districts. Um, so yes, we'll, we'll have we'll have primaries in a number of places, and uh, we'll we'll have to see you know how everything plays out. We got about three minutes left. Either one of you who wants to, Erwin asked, what are the talking points to address economic issues right now? I mean, um, it, sorry, you can go ahead, Representative Alston. I mean, I was going to say, I think, I think it probably depends on the area of the state that you're in. You know, I think something that's important, uh, and I know from my perspective and thinking about a lot of these districts and in, in, in regions and in counties that are much different than Durham is, you know, making sure that the, the talking points, that the message and what we're responsive to in terms of the policy needs are respect the needs of the communities um, in these districts. And so, I think I guess part of my answer is it's going to vary in terms of yeah what the what the message is so yeah so I'll, I'll set that as the stage um, and Senator Chaudhry if you want to go ahead I mean look I, I would say uh, a couple of talking points and unfortunately I, I don't think that the party does a good message around this um, but uh, but look I mean I think so one of the things that we hear from Republicans, and they really kind of beat the drum on this, is they talk about inflation, inflation, inflation. But folks aren't talking about wage growth that we're seeing. But more importantly, I mean, at least with, with President Joe Biden, I mean, he has created more jobs in his time in office than uh, three times the com combined amount of offices created by the last three pre Republican presidents of our uh, in, 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 in our country. Uh, Trump, both Bushes, um, their job, their job growth, just kind of pales in comparison to what uh, President Biden has done just in this last year and a half. But I, I think to really more, you know, bring this back at the state and local level. I mean, I think Representative Meyer and Alston. I mean, and you all read this in the paper. I mean, I think the number of job announcements that Governor Cooper has made really over the last year has been just unprecedented. I mean, absolutely unprecedented. I mean, I think. Last year in 2021, 26,000 job announcements with over $10 billion invested in the state. I mean, I, 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 think what, I think what that reflects is that the investments that we've made in our universities and our community colleges and public education are bringing dividends. I think it shows the genius of the Research Triangle Park, um, which we are all part of. Um, but, we, but we know that's the way of the future for North Carolina. We can't um, give up on that. I mean, you, you're going to hear a lot about corporate tax cuts from Republicans, uh, but I, I think we we have to take a lot of pride in the job announcements we have because those those employers are coming here because of our talent and our workforce, which I frankly am uh, somewhat worried because with the number of job announcements we, we have, we've got to invest more in our community colleges and in universities and public education, make sure we can fill those jobs now. I'm going to, it's 8.30, but I'm going to pick up from my colleagues here and I'm going to add a little bit on economic messaging. Um, 
the knowledge economy of the triangle triad and triangle is already driving tremendous economic growth and what's going to happen next is that we are going to build green transportation commuter rail from those major urban areas out into the exurban areas like Roxborough, Rocky Mount, Cabarrus County. That commuter rail is going to mean that people are going to be able to work in the knowledge economy and live in the outskirts without contributing to climate, uh, to carbon emissions and making the climate worse. And here's what's going to transform North Carolina even more than that, because that's just ride, ride, riding on the dividends of the Research Triangle Park and the Charlotte banking economy. Here's what's coming next. You know that we are having a Toyota battery plant in the new in the mega site that's coming uh, between the triangle and the triad, basically. What you don't know is that North Carolina is going to become the hub of offshore wind all up and down the East Coast. We're going to manufacture the, the, the giant offshore wind turbines. We're going to transmit that here. We're going to figure out how to get that electricity all through the East Coast. It's going to be a huge number of jobs in Eastern North Carolina. And it's going to be jobs for people who have college degrees and jobs for people who are skilled laborers, all of them earning great wages and taking care of parts of the state that haven't been uh, taken care of. And so think about if you're producing the energy and you're producing the batteries, that, my friends, is the 21st century economy. That's how we stop climate change, and that's how we employ people to make a better North Carolina and a better world for all of us. We are going to be doing so many amazing things over the next decade. What we need is we need strong leadership, and that's why you need to elect great people to the North Carolina General Assembly. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm going to turn it back to Becca, Susan, uh, patients and everybody else from Neighbors on Call to close us out. Thanks for having Jay and Vernetta and myself on. We would love your support this year as well. Thanks, friends. See you soon. All right. Thank you. Wow, that was a very positive and visionary note to end on to really give us something to fight for. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Representative Meyer, Senator Chowdhury, Representative Alston. Thank you for being here, for talking with us, for sharing all of that detailed information with us. Everyone, thank you for being here. We already have about 65 signups for March and April, which is a great start. We know it's gonna go up because we just had a canvas for Ricky Hurtado a couple of weeks ago where 60 people showed up. So we know that those numbers are gonna go up and uh, you'll have lots of good company. So thank you so much. We will send out the link again tomorrow and um, you'll get an email from us every Monday. That's our weekly email. It comes from your chapter leaders. And thank you again so much for being here. Good night. And the uh, recording of this will be posted sometime tomorrow afternoon. So you can go back and, uh, and the quiz is Friday. <laughs> Thank you so much to all these great speakers.